So, hello everybody. Um, I'd like to start by thanking ProIdea for inviting me to speak here today. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for attending this new conference. One of the themes of my talk today is the importance of your time. And I'm incredibly grateful that you've chosen to spend your time with me. My name is Paul Hammond. Uh, I make websites. I make tools for people that make websites. These days, I'm a freelance engineer and operations person. I write Ruby and PHP and Perl and Go and Python and whatever. I spent uh, five or six years at the BBC in London. Uh, then I spent a few years at Yahoo and Flickr in San Francisco. And I just spent the last three years working on a service called Typekit. And I'm here today to talk about infrastructure for startups. But I'm going to start by talking about sunscreen. A woman called Mary Schmidt wrote a commencement speech about sunscreen. And she started by saying, if I could offer you just one tip for the future, sunscreen would be it. The long-term benefits of sunscreen have been proven by scientists, whereas the rest of my uh, advice has no basis more reliable than my own meandering experience. And she's right. Her advice applies here, too. You should wear sunscreen. But more importantly, you should realize that everything I'm going to say today is based on my experience. And I've seen a fair number of startups, but I've not seen all of them. And so the advice I give today may not apply to you. It's very easy to look at talks, to listen to talks like the one I'm giving, and just copy everything I say. But if you're not building exactly the same thing that I've built, then some of my advice might not apply. And I'm going to try and indicate where my advice isn't universal, but I might be wrong. Be skeptical. And if what I say doesn't feel right, don't do it. So, infrastructure for startups. I like to think about the definitions of words. Uh, and, and the first word is infrastructure. This is the basic foundations of society or of an enterprise. It's the things we build on top of. And a startup is a new business. That's not really very useful. So what do other people have to say? There's a man called Eric Ries, who is the author of The Lean Startup. And he says that a startup is a human institution designed to deliver a new product or a new service under extreme conditions of extreme uncertainty. It is you trying to start a new product with a lot of risk. His colleague Steve Blank says that a startup is an organization formed to search for a repeatable or scalable business model. A startup is a group of people that don't know how they're going to make money, but they're looking for a way. A startup is a group of people who are trying to find a way to make money. But in particular, a startup is a group of people who have borrowed some money to find a way to make money. And that might be that they've borrowed money from investors. It might be that they've borrowed money from their credit card. It might be that they've borrowed money from their bank. Or it might just be that they're not making money right now because they're not earning money. And so they're borrowing money against their potential earnings. So in many ways, a startup is an exercise in, in debt management, in managing your debts. And in the past, when I've been talking about startups, I've suggested there's five or four rules uh, for startup infrastructure based on this idea of startup as debt management. But there is really only one rule when it comes to startups and managing debt, and that is don't run out of money. If you run out of money, your company has failed. If you don't run out of money, you still have a chance of making it. So you do everything you can to avoid running out of money. It sounds easy, right? So here is another quote. This is from Fred, Fred Wilson, who runs Union Square Ventures in New York City. He's an investor in Twitter, in Foursquare, in, a, uh, in Etsy, in a whole number of startups. And he says that a good rule of thumb when you're thinking about money at a startup and to think about how quickly you're using your money is to multiply the number of people on the team by $10,000, and that's how much money you're going to spend each month. And the exact amount of money varies depending on where you are, but in my experience, he's right. And the interesting thing about this quote is that he doesn't mention servers. He doesn't mention lawyers. He doesn't mention travel. He doesn't mention sales lunches. He doesn't mention any of the costs of a startup. He only mentions the number of people. And that's because these days, employees are by far the biggest cost to any startup. Another way of looking at this is that your time is incredibly valuable, and you shouldn't waste it. So quick show of hands, who here has heard of Typekit? OK, a few people. 
So uh, Typekit is a web font hosting service. It makes it possible for you to use good fonts on your website. Uh, and there's two things it deals with. It deals with the technical side of that, making sure that it, uh, all of the browsers are supported. But it also deals with all the legal problems of making sure that the fonts are correctly licensed and correctly paid for. And they do a lot of work behind the scenes to make sure that the fonts look great on the platforms. Uh, as a service, it's been going for about four years. I joined about three years ago. And we as a company were acquired by Adobe about a year and a half ago. But Typekit didn't start out as Typekit. Back in 2008, Jeff Veen and Brian Mason decided they wanted to start a company together. They'd worked together in the past. They knew they wanted to work again in the future. Uh, and so they decided to start a company. And they needed a name to incorporate, but they didn't know what they were going to do yet. So they called it Small Batch Inc. because they like bourbon. And the very first thing they did was to run a conference uh, in San Francisco. And it was called Start. And it was about how to start a business. And there were two sides to this conference. The first thing was that they wanted to learn from some of the people they respect about how to run startups, how to build a startup. So they put on a conference so that they could attend the conference, so that they could learn from those people. But also, running a conference forced them to deal with a bunch of stuff that you need to do when, you, uh, when you're starting up a business. They needed a bank account because they needed to take money. They needed liability insurance because they needed to make sure that if they got sued, that they wouldn't go bankrupt. And there were a whole bunch of little things like this that they needed to set up in order to put on the conference. And these were useful things that they knew they would need when they were starting the business. And the lesson I take from this as the very first thing they did is that you should, whenever you're building a new enterprise, whenever you're building a startup, you should look for an excuse to build any of the infrastructure you think you might need. Um, if a particular project looks like it will force you to build something, then that, that can be a good thing, and it can be an excuse. Pretty soon after that conference, two more people joined, Greg and Ryan, and they started working on products together. And the very first product they launched was this, was WikiRank. Uh, WikiRank was an analysis tool. It was based on the access logs from Wikipedia. Uh, it analyzes those logs, and it tries to find interesting patterns. And there's two, inter two interesting things about WikiRank. The first is that this was obviously never going to make enough money to pay for four people's salary. Um, it was a project for them to practice working together again, because they hadn't worked together for a long time, and they wanted to make sure that they understood how the team dynamics worked. But it was also a project to practice working with new technologies. All four of them had been working for big companies for a few years, and during that time, a number of new technologies had come out, including Hadoop, including Amazon's web services and EC2. And so the team used WikiRank as an excuse, uh, as a playground for those tools, to see how they work in, a, in a, an environment where it didn't matter if they messed up. The lesson I take from this is that it's a really good idea to look for isolated places to test out new technology. If you're, if you're trying something for the first time, you don't want to do it on, on an important site or service. If you can find something that doesn't matter, then, then it gives you an excuse to fail. And once they built type, uh, once they'd built WikiRank, then they, uh, then they started on Typekit. Uh, this is a photo taken in early 2009. And in May 2009, they felt confident enough in the service that they uh, announced, pre-announced it on their blog post. In June 2009, they announced that they'd secured funding based on this as an idea. And then in November 2009, they actually launched to uh, beta users. It took them 18 months from starting the company to actually rolling out the very first version of their service, uh, a year after they started work on Typekit. The lesson I draw from this is that launching a product is really, really hard. And anything you can do to make that job easier is a good idea. The stack that we launched with uh, Included a lot of things. Uh, included Merb and Data Mapper. It included Rescue, MySQL, Redis, Chef. We were on Ubuntu. We used our Syslog. We used Munin and Pingdom. We used Slicehost. We used Dynect. We used Edgecast. And then around the edges, we used GitHub for code hosting. We used Google Apps for our email and for documents. We used Dropbox. We used Campfire from 37 Signals as a chat tool. We used Skype when we wanted to talk to each other. Uh, we used a really nice screen sharing service called join.me, and we tried every single project tracking tool you have ever heard of uh, and didn't like any of them. And I'm going to go through each of these in turn and talk a little bit about why we use them and what you can learn from them. 
I'm going to start with Merb and Data Mapper. Um, has anyone here heard of Merb? There are like three hands in the audience. So um, Merb is a web framework. It's an alternative to Rails. It's written in Ruby. Um, and this is a screenshot of the home page. Um, and I don't know about you, but when I look at this screenshot, I think this page looks like it hasn't been touched since 2008. And that's because it hasn't. In 2008, um, the Merb team and the Rails team decided that they liked what the other team were doing, and they merged the two projects into one project. And that was the basis of Rails 3. And when they made this announcement, they said that they would specifically be looking after the people that were using Merb and give them a migration path to Rails 3. They said, to be perfectly clear, we are not abandoning the Merb project. This is a screenshot of, what, of the documentation on how to upgrade to Rails 3 today. Uh, for those of you who can't read it from the back, there is nothing on this page. Uh, my colleague David Demery gave a presentation at the Chicago RubyConf about what Typekit did to migrate from Merv to Rails. But the summary is that it took us over two years to move the entire application over. And the lesson I draw from this is that the early technology choices you make, you'll find that you'll be stuck with them for a very long time. Uh, the pressure to deliver new features and functionality is really great, and you don't have time to stop and rebuild your infrastructure from the ground up. So when you're looking at your initial technology choices, it's a really good idea to choose, um, choose wisely, to choose things that you know will work, to choose tr tried and trusted technologies. It's not the time to try the latest new thing you read about on Hacker News last week. Who's heard of Data Mapper? Oh, slightly more. OK, five or six people. Uh, Data Mapper is basically Merb's active record. Unlike Merb, it's still going strong. There is still a small community, but it has nowhere near as much uptake as active record. And when we launched, we launched on version 0.9.11. It was the latest version the day we started writing code. And over the years, we found a lot of bugs in this version of Data Mapper, along with many performance problems. Of course, Data Mapper has improved since then. Uh, they launched a 1.0 in uh, 2009, I believe. And this was the announcement that the transition from the 0.1.0 series to 1.0 involves several changes regarding how you interact with Data Mapper. In other words, it's backwards incompatible, and they didn't give you any documentation on what had changed. This is better than the previous launch, which says that they have been working on it for 11 months. They made 1,250 changes and fixed 140 tickets. This is the entire launch announcement. We have no idea what they changed in that time. We found that it was easier for us to migrate to Active Record than it was for us to upgrade Data Mapper, because at least we knew what was going on. A few minutes ago, I said, you'll be stuck with your choices, technology choices, for a long time, and you should choose wisely. And this is especially true of anything involving your data. That moving, da moving data around, changing how you access data is scary, because if you make a mistake, then you can cause data corruption. But the other lesson I take is that you should keep up with upgrades. That whatever technology choice you make, it will be continuing to be developed. And if you fall two versions behind, then you'll find it very, very hard to catch up. And it is much easier for you to keep up with the upgrades as they happen, instead of waiting for a day when you're going to have time. On the queuing side, we used a system called Rescue, which uh, at the time was the state of the art in Rails queuing frameworks. These days, a system called Sidekick is, is much more popular and, and is a lot better. Other people use systems called uh, use Gearman or maybe Apache Kafka. Um, I think the important thing here is that at some point in your scaling story, you're going to realize that you're going to need to do work out of the web request, that you're going to need to do work asynchronously. And if you start with a queuing system in place, that entire process becomes much easier. Because once you've got that queuing in system in place, you can, you can build your systems asynchronously. You don't need to do everything in line, and you don't need to rebuild things later. So it's a really good idea, in my opinion, to start out with a queue, because every web app I've ever seen has needed one. On the data storage side, we use MySQL and Redis. And 
These days, it's MySQL Redis and Elasticsearch. You're going to be stuck with your technology choices for a while. You should choose wisely. Um, and in particular, MySQL is a proven, known technology. Um, I learned how to scale MySQL from Cal Henderson's book, Building Scalable Websites, which was published eight years ago. And everything he wrote about in that book was something that had been known for many, many years before then. Um, MySQL is understood, will scale, is solid. Postgres is also understood, will scale, is solid. Some of the newer systems that you might hear about are still unknown. And if you choose them, then you might find out that, that it doesn't do what you might think it does. Of course, Redis is new as well. And so it sounds like that's something that we're, I'm not taking my own advice there. But Redis doesn't do very much. And that's one of the reasons that it's really good at what it does. Um, it's a very, very simple system. And, and we like it a lot for the small things it does. And likewise, Elasticsearch is a new system. But our search needs were very small, and Elasticsearch is very easy to use. So we felt confident that, that Elasticsearch would solve our needs. And if we ever need more than that, then, then a migration to solar is something that's quite possible. We don't use Elasticsearch as the definitive data store for anything. One thing to look out for when you're choosing technology is that you might read something like this. So this is Salvador Sanfilippo, who is the uh, lead developer of Redis. In 2011, he said, Redis Cluster is definitely the next big thing. We will ship it next quarter. It's two years later, and Redis Cluster is still not production ready. It's important to choose a technology based on what it does today and not what it might do in the future. Because things slip, things take time, things don't do what they, uh, the maintainers expect them to do. Of course, the problem with MySQL is that you have to deal with schema changes. And, and, and that is a difficult thing to do once you have data in the database, that, that it takes time to do schema changes. And there's a lot of debate right now about how do you do a schema change without taking your database server down, without taking your site down. MySQL also doesn't handle um, multi-data center replication. It doesn't handle multiple um, masters talking to each other particularly well. And so you might ask, well, how, as a startup, do we make sure that we don't have downtime, but we still manage to maintain our database? And the answer is, you don't. Whenever Typekit needs to do a schema change, we take the site down for 10, 20 minutes. We announce a few days beforehand that we're going to do so. We do it at 8 PM Pacific time, when everyone in Europe is fast asleep, where everyone in America has gone home for the day, and the, the only people using the site are in, are in Asia and Australia. And it's a low traffic time for us. And we've never had any complaints about the site being down for 15 minutes, as long as it's been pre-announced. Now, we're a professional tool. We're used by people during the day. Other people may find that, that that time doesn't work for them. But I think it's important to recognize that until you have a proven business model, until you're, until you're large, you don't need 99.999% uptime. And even though as engineers, we want to deliver the very best product we can, sometimes you need to accept that sometimes downtime is OK. For configuration management, we use Chef. And we started out with a Chef Solo-based workflow. In 2011, we moved to Chef Server. And you might be asking, well, why did you use Chef and not Puppet or Ansible or any other configuration management system? And I will say, I will assert that no startup has ever failed because they picked the wrong configuration management system. Chef is good enough. Puppet is good enough. Ansible is good enough. In many cases, Bash scripts are good enough. Likewise, we used Ubuntu long-term um, LTS, Ubuntu 10.04. And you might say, why Ubuntu? Why not Red Hat? Why not CentOS? Why not Debian? Again, no startup has ever failed because they picked Red Hat instead of Debian, or vice versa. There are many more important things to worry about. Some of the decisions that you're faced as a startup don't matter. You should pick one and move on. And if it turns out that you're wrong, you can change it in the future. One of the things we had to look at uh, when we started writing more complex systems was uh, to ask which, um, which process monitoring should we use. Should we use Upstart? Should we use init scripts? Should we use Runit? Should we use God? And so on. And we picked Upstart. The reason we picked Upstart is because we use Ubuntu. Um, and we've realized that, 
it's important to use a tool the way it was intended to be used. If you're going to pick Ubuntu, then, then use Ubuntu. If you don't like the way that works, then pick a different tool. Another way of saying this is to go with the flow. For logging, we started out with an rsyslog server, um, just a straightforward vanilla rsyslog install listening on the network. Later on, we decided to switch to PaperTrail. PaperTrail is a hosted rsyslog service that gives you search. Um, they run rsyslog for you, and, and you, can, you can search the results uh, through a web UI or through a command line interface. And you might ask, well, a syslog server is really easy to run. You install the package, you start it up, you go. Why on earth would you use paper trail when it's so much more expensive? And we found that paper trail is better than anything we would have time to build ourselves. That it's not just a syslog server. It is, it is a syslog server plus a web UI, plus search, plus graphs, plus alerts, plus a whole bunch of other interesting things. And, and we wouldn't have had time to build all of that. Employees are the biggest cost to a startup, and anything you can do to save their time is a good idea. We also actually find that paper trail is cheaper than running it ourselves, because not least because we're not spending time on it, but also that they have economies of scale that we don't have. We found that hosted services are usually cheaper and better than anything you'll have time to build yourself, especially when it comes to behind the scenes systems, and you should use them as much as possible. But if you really don't want to send your logs to someone else, then Logstash is very good, and you should look at it. On the monitoring side, we used Munin. And the problem with Munin is that the resolution of all of the graphs and all of the alerts is hard-coded to five minutes, and there's no way to change that. There's no way to make it alert more frequently than once every five minutes. There's no way to make it graph more frequently than once every five minutes. So after a while, we switched to CollectD and Nagios and a whole bunch of custom code. And there's a movement in the operations space right now called monitoring sucks. And they're right, monitoring does suck. But they decided that that was too negative. So they changed it to monitoring love. And they've started conferences, and they do things like make cupcakes in the shape of a monitoring love logo. And they're building a lot of tools. Um, there is a conference next year here in Europe called Monitorama uh, that I strongly recommend you go to. Uh, and there's a community, this group, are doing some amazing things. The tools that they're building are really great. They are incredibly powerful. They do some amazing things, especially compared to the state of the art it, it, five years ago. But the tools they're building are complicated, and they need to be linked together in complex ways. And this leads to this notion that um, Nick calls DevOps spaghetti. It's this idea that you have these two different systems to hook together. You need to hook up Munin and Graphite. And so you write this small Ruby script, and you call it Munin's graphite.rb, and you put it on a server somewhere. And the data flows, and everything is great until it breaks at 3 o'clock in the morning. And you're trying to explain to someone how it works, and you can't quite remember yourself. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to have to understand the details of a huge number of complex open source projects. Every extra component in my infrastructure, especially in the monitoring stack, is something that's likely to break, and it's likely to break at the worst possible time. And I don't want everyone on the team to have to understand half a dozen different monitoring applications and how they fit together. I just want to be woken up when the site is down. This is the only thing that I want to be woken up for, and it's the most important thing I want to be woken up for. Matthias Mayer, who uh, works for Travis CI, has taken this idea further. Um, some services, it's not just about the site being up. Travis CI is a hosted continuous integration server. And they realized that it's no good their site being up if they're not running builds. And so they thought long and hard about this. And they realized that the last time a build ran is what they call their sole metric. It's the one metric that matters most to the health of the service. And in the early days, it's really tempting to add alerts for every single thing that you can think of, everything that might go wrong, everything that might warn that your site is about to go down. But once you add alerts, it's very, very difficult to remove them. And it sounds counterintuitive, but I believe that you're better off limiting the number of alerts you set up in the early days to just one, uh, your sole metric. Is the site up? Are we serving customers right now? And if we are, don't wake me up. If we're not, wake me up. The easiest tool to do this with, in my experience, is Pingdom. Um, it tells you when your site is down, and that's what it does. It measures it from many places around the world, and it's very, very reliable. 
and you can easily hook ping them up to a service called PagerDuty. And PagerDuty makes sure that when something goes wrong, someone gets woken up. It phones you, it texts you, and if you don't answer, it phones you and texts you again. And if you still don't answer, it phones your manager. And if it's, he doesn't answer, it phones someone else. It keeps going until someone wakes up and acknowledges that something has gone wrong and starts trying to fix it. But you get woken up, and you ask, well, wh what happened? And that's where you need your graphs. And there's a whole bunch of services out there that will make it easy for you to graph everything you need. Uh, one of the best known is New Relic. New Relic, you install a Ruby gem, you install a, a, a small library into your application, and they give you a ton of graphs telling you everything that's going on and the performance of your application. Datadog in New York are doing the same thing for server metrics, as are Liberato in San Francisco, as are Server Density in London. All of these services will work. All of these services are good enough when you start. All of them you will outgrow a few years down the line. But you should pick one, and you should start graphing, so that when things go wrong, you can, you can look back and try and understand what's happened, and you can look back and try and understand where in the logs you should be looking and what you should be debugging. When we uh, first launched, we were hosted on Slicehost. And Slicehost was a virtual server provider um, run by two guys in, somewhere in America. And a few months after we launched, they got acquired by Rackspace. Uh, Slicehost is now the basis of the old version of Rackspace Cloud. These days, we're on Rackspace and EC2. Um, and you might ask, well, why, why Rackspace and EC2? Why are you not doing dedicated servers? Why are you not, you know? There is a school of thought that EC2 is incredibly expensive. And, and if you have a application that you understand the performance characteristics of it and you can benchmark it, then you will find, as my friend Arta did, that EC2 is perhaps 16 times more expensive than running a server in a data center. But what that doesn't take into account is that employees are expensive. And if you have servers in a data center, then someone needs to go to the data center to put the servers in. When something breaks, someone needs to fly back to the data center to fix it. And every day that they're spending in the data center is a day they're not spending working on new functionality or working on improving your tooling. I think that it's a really good idea to start with EC2. Now, Brian talked a lot about Heroku earlier on. I think that the transition from from running your own servers to, from running on Heroku to running your own servers is very difficult and very disruptive. And I think that everyone outgrows Heroku really quickly. Um, and that and the installing a Ruby application on a server is, is a two-day job. Um, so I think it's easier to start with EC2 than deal with that transition later. Other people disagree with me. But I think it's important to not start with uh, with hardware in a data center. The upfront costs, and in particular, the amount of time it takes to get that going, is so much more difficult than putting a credit card into Amazon's web UI, and you have a server five minutes later. Of course, the problem with virtual environments like EC2 and Rackspace Cloud is that databases are very, very difficult to, to run in virtual environments. The disk I.O. characteristics are, are pretty terrible on most of them, and that makes, in particular, database storage difficult. If you're on EC2, you have the question of whether you want to use the ephemeral disk store or whether you want to use elastic, black sto uh, elastic block storage. And you have to think about, well, how are you going to do backups? Do you want to use uh, disk snapshotting? Do you want to use uh, a database level tool like uh, InnoDB backup? And you end up with a whole bunch of complex questions like this. The simplest thing for you to do when you get started is to rent the biggest server you can and stop worrying about all of this. Uh, the biggest server that Amazon sells is still cheaper than your typical employee, and it will have enough RAM that you can store your entire data set in RAM for a very long time. Um, we did this. We spent weeks worrying about how our database server was performing, and someone told us to do this, and we did it, and we didn't worry about our database again for a year. It was amazing. So um, just rent a really big server, and, and your database problems will go away. On the DNS side, we used a company called Dynect. Uh, I hear really, really good things about Amazon's Route 53. Basically, DNS is a solved problem right now. 
Um, and people like Dynect and Amazon are better at running redundant DNS servers than you are, and you should use them. For a CDN, we used Edgecast. This is their front page. Uh, and the problem with CDNs is that you decide that you want to start using a CDN, and you hear that Akamai are really great, and so you think, well, okay, I'll sign up with Akamai, and this is the sign-up form. Please call us, or fill out the information below, and one of our representatives will reply to you. It's very difficult to sign up for most CDNs without talking to someone on the phone, without talking to them about what your needs are, and without negotiating a custom one-off contract. And as a startup, you don't have time the reason that the CDNs do this is that if you're not haggling with them, if you're not negotiating the contracts, and if you're not customizing the contracts to your specific needs, then you're probably paying too much money to that CDN. And so this sales uh, person based um, sign-up flow makes sense because it works for them and it works for you. But as a startup, you're too small to haggle with a company like Akamai. You have no traffic, you have no leverage in any negotiations whatsoever. And so you'll be paying massively over the odds. In my experience, you're much better off picking a CDN that you can just sign up with a web form and be started the same day. My favorite one of these CDNs is a new CDN called Firstly. Um, they have a small plan that is $50 a month, which is ideal for startups. But I should mention I'm biased. My wife works at Firstly. So the other option is Amazon's CloudFront, uh, which doesn't just work with S3. You can use it with any origin server. It has a huge amount of customizations that you can do to make it work with your specific needs. And, and you'll still be paying over the odds with, with CloudFront or Fastly. As a small company, you'll be paying more than you might be able to if you have much larger scale, but it will get you started and it will get you started quickly. And you won't have to talk to anyone, which is great. Now at Typekit, our use of a CDN was different to most companies. Most companies just use a CDN to make their website faster. They might put images on a CDN, they might put um, some aspects of their front page on a CDN just to get some acceleration. For us, we used it for the actual serving of fonts to customers' websites. And, and we had two particular requirements for that font network. The first is that it had to be up all the time. Um, if we went down, then that means that other, our customers' sites stop working or start looking ugly, and that's not good. And secondly, it needs to have really good performance. We started using a CDM for our core font serving network because it was better than anything the two engineers by themselves would be able to put together, even with all of the time in the world. The first scaling plan before they launched Typekit was that we would copy all of the font files to an origin run by Edgecast, and then we would let them deal with it. We would sleep easily at night. And that worked really, really great for a year and a half. And then on December 16th, 2010, I woke up to this tweet from my friend Dan. He was frustrated about how any site that uses Typekit was hanging. I looked at the graphs. This is the graph from Pingdon showing response time. Um, and you might not be able to see it at the back, but for an hour or so, our response time had gone up to five seconds to download a font, which is obviously completely unacceptable. But it had also fixed itself without us doing anything, which is one of the great things about using hosted services, is they sometimes fix themselves without you doing anything. So we thought everything was okay. Except we realized that we weren't able to publish kits for one of our biggest partners. And then we realized why we had gone down. Because our biggest partner had just launched. They'd gone from a private beta service with a few hundred thousand users to a few million users in one day. And the problem with CDN origins is that they're designed to handle really, really high throughput on reads. They're not great for doing really high throughput on writes. So we huddled together, we thought, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna be able to handle this load? Because Edgecast aren't able to handle it for us. We said, we're gonna build our own origin server. We're gonna rebuild everything about the publishing pipeline, and we're gonna move everything for about.me over to this new system, and we're gonna do it in two days. And one of the reasons we were able to put this plan together so quickly is that we'd started to think about what it was gonna take for us to move off Edgecast in the future. But we'd planned to do it in a few months. So two days later, we switched everything over, and that was great. And we were really happy about it. And the same day, About.me announced they'd been acquired by AOL, and so their traffic went up again. And we were really glad that we'd spent that weekend fixing things for them. <laughs> 
The lesson here for me is not about the heroics of doing things in a weekend. That will happen to you and you will deal with it. The lesson for me is that any of the systems that you use will behave in incredibly unexpected ways as they grow. And in case you think I'm picking on Edgecast here, I'm not. Uh, Amazon S3 has the situation where if you start to request more data from S3 quickly, you will find that the response time goes down for a while before it starts improving again. And that's because behind the scenes, they're reconfiguring their servers, they're reconfiguring your bucket to handle the new growth. But as they reconfigure it, they need to move data around. And as they're moving data around, they don't have as much capacity to serve your read rates. S3 is not unique here. Every single system you use will reach a scaling point where it stops behaving in the way you expect it to and starts behaving in an unusual way. And it will happen just as you don't want it to because you've just started getting more traffic. The real problem with Edgecast was that we didn't notice that we had grown until it was too late. And once we'd realized that we'd grown too much, it took us over a year to migrate everyone over to the new origin that we built in a weekend. For every infrastructure provider that you use, it is worth you just having in the back of your mind an idea of what the escape plan will be for that infrastructure provider. And it might be that you switch off a feature on your site. It might be that you, um, that you pay someone else. It might be that you pay them more money to do it. But just know what you would do if it turns out that the infrastructure provider stops being able to provide the service that they provide to you. The two other services I'd like to talk about are GitHub organizations. Uh, GitHub organizations and github.com is awesome for shared teams. Uh, we use them, they're great, and they look after your code better than you would. Uh, I highly recommend them. And the other thing is Google Apps for your domain. When you start up, it's really tempting to just keep using your personal email addresses. Um, and that gets really messy really quickly. There's two ways it gets messy. The first is you cannot switch off for a day because your personal life and your work life are completely intertwined. If you have two separate email addresses, then you can choose to not read your work email for a day. Or you can choose to not read your personal email for a day because you're busy and you have that option. The other thing is that as you grow, uh, as you get acquired, then you start to find that you might get legal claims on some aspect of your email. And it's a really good idea for you to keep those two things separate so that the lawyers can't get to your personal email. There's been a recurring trend, uh, recurring uh, theme to everything I've just been talking about, which is this idea of do you buy something or do you build it? I think it, that, and, and I've been recommending buying as much as possible. I think there's a few exceptions to that rule. The first is that if you are building infrastructure yourself, for example, if you are building a CDN, then you need to use your own hardware. You need to actually build a CDN. You don't want to use someone else's because you're, you're part of the infrastructure. You need to manage that carefully. And there are a few scenarios in which you have actually unique requirements. For example, if you're a data analysis startup and you have the requirement to store huge amounts of data, then you're probably going to need to build a custom solution to store and manage and search and query that data. You might find that existing products don't meet your specific needs. Um, for example, they might not have the exact functionality you require to be able to serve the things that you need to require. You might find that none of the off-the-shelf billing services bill in the way that you need your subscription model to work, for example. And if that's the case, then maybe you're going to have to build your own. The other thing you sometimes find is that there are some services out there where buying it actually does cost more than an engineer's salary. And if that's the case, then maybe you should just pay an engineer to do it instead of paying someone else far too much money. Otherwise, I think you should just buy an off-the-shelf service and use it, at least for now. You're going to outgrow it at some point in the future, but it will get you started. And getting started is the most important thing. But if you're using someone else as an infrastructure provider, it's still your problem if they go down. Um, when I was preparing the first version of this slide deck uh, last year, uh, a few weeks beforehand, Amazon EC2 had an outage. And it was really, really interesting watching the various responses. Uh, Lanyard, which is a conference, uh, a website for conference goers, went down. And they said on Twitter, we're really sorry. There's, well, actually, they didn't say sorry. They said an outage on EC2 and RDS is affecting a whole bunch of startups, including us. Here's a link to Y um, Hacker News. They didn't even say sorry. They just said, it wasn't our fault. Look, everyone else is having problems. 
And, and if your infrastructure provider goes down, and that means that your site goes down, then you should say sorry, because it's still your fault. You chose to use Amazon EC2, you chose to use that infrastructure provider, and you didn't have a backup plan. And that might be a perfectly reasonable business decision, but that was still your choice. So you should apologize. A much better way to handle this is to not name the infrastructure provider whilst giving the status update. It forces you to take responsibility. It forces you to not pass the blame on to someone else. Uh, so Quora, for example, said that they're working really hard to restore full functionality and they're, and they're sorry and thanks for the patience. Everyone knew when they saw the status update that Quora were down because EC2 were down, because every other startup had gone down at the same time and all of the tech press was full of stories about problems with Amazon at that time. But, but Cora took responsibility for their own site and service. The best response was from PagerDuty, which they just said, well, we flipped over to our secondary provider and we're carrying on. Um, now, PagerDuty need to be up all the time because they're an alert notification service. Uh, but, but if you're in the position where you can do this, then that's really great. So we've got the question, do you buy or do you build? Well, there's a third option. Maybe you do neither. Maybe you just do without this particular piece of functionality. In the startup world right now, there is this idea of the minimum viable product. Steve Blank, who I mentioned earlier, says that the minimum viable product is the version of a product that allows you to collect the maximum amount of learning from customers with the minimum amount of effort. An example of the minimum viable product is you might just create a Google AdWords campaign selling your product that doesn't exist and click, track how many people click through to determine whether or not there's an audience. You might create a sign-up form and just see how many email addresses you sign up. And that tells you something about whether people are interested in a service. Or you might build a, a, a service that doesn't do all of the things you want it to do, but does the bare, bare minimum just to see whether there is an audience for that service and whether people are willing to pay for it. And in the same way as you have this notion of minimum viable product, I think you have this idea of minimum viable infrastructure. What is the smallest amount of infrastructure you need to put in place to build your product? Because you're not Facebook or Etsy or Twitter yet. You don't have 150 engineers yet. You don't need the perfect admin tools for your site just yet. You don't need to automate everything that might go wrong, at least not yet. You don't need to graph everything yet. You don't need your data store to be highly scalable to cope with billions and billions and billions of, of, of objects, at least not yet. You don't need to worry about being able to fail over to another vendor if Amazon goes down, at least not yet. And you don't need 100% uptime, at least not yet. All you need to do is make sure that you don't run out of money before you launch your service. Your time is the most valuable thing, and you should avoid wasting it. This is my favorite quote about startups ever. There are two kinds of startups. There are the kinds of startups that create some kind of modest traction on top of a pile of code of which they're ashamed of, embarrassed of, and there are the startups that go out of business. There is no third kind. Every startup is embarrassed about what they built on top of. You should avoid setting up infrastructure you don't need. This sounds obvious, but until you actually need something, don't build it. You, th you, you think you're going to need monitoring. You think you might need an A-B testing platform. You think you might need a payment system. Until you actually need that, don't build it. And when you need it, you can build it then. As an example of this, um, I spent a week or so at Typekit making sure that if one of our EC2 servers went down, it would be automatically replaced without anyone doing anything. And this took about a week of work, uh, and, and it happened exactly once two years later. And it happened during the middle of the day when I was watching the servers. Um, I wish I'd spent that week doing something else. Uh, automation is a great example of the kind of infrastructure you probably don't need, but you think you do. Instead of automating something, instead of writing scripts so that servers do things for you, you can just create a checklist. If one of our servers goes down, here are the five things you need to do to bring one back up again. As the Agile people say, you ain't going to need it. You don't need it just now. But you should also make sure that you do spend the time to build infrastructure you do need. Once you realize that you need a graphing platform, spend the time and build a graphing platform right. If you realize you need bucket testing, do bucket testing. 
spend a few days working on it, spend a week working on it if that's what it takes, get it set up, and then move on. Uh, it's very easy to just keep hacking things together and relying on not having everything you need, and sometimes you just need to spend the time to do it right. For interdependent startups, there are three possible outcomes. You can become a successful ongoing business, whether that's Google or 37 Signals, where you continue to make enough money every month to pay your bills, and you continue to grow, and everyone is happy. You will probably fail, like most startups do, or you'll be acquired. And if you get acquired, it will be for one of three reasons. A company will acquire you for your technology, or for your product, or for your people. If the company is acquiring your team, then they're going to shut your product down, as we see a lot with Facebook and Google and so on. If they're acquiring your product, as for example Google did with YouTube, then they're going to want to rebuild it entirely from the ground up on their infrastructure, as Google did with YouTube. And if they're acquiring your technology, then they're going to be integrating it into an existing product, and you're going to be spending a lot of time rebuilding your technology on top of some new infrastructure. In other words, all startup infrastructure is temporary. Whatever course your startup goes, whether you fail, whether you get acquired, whether you're successful, the infrastructure that you build is going to get thrown away after a few years. And you should realize that, and you should build accordingly. Every startup scaling story I have ever seen, whether it's Flickr, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Pinterest, Twitter, Instagram, has followed this same pattern. The team found the biggest problem with the site today. They fixed the biggest problem with the site today. And then they rinsed, and they repeated, and they did it again and again and again. I have never heard of a startup that started out by building up front all of the infrastructure they needed for the next few years based on all of the things they heard from other companies and then immediately succeeded based on top of that infrastructure. This doesn't happen. Mike Krieger says that most of your initial scaling problems won't be glamorous. There'll be things you don't expect. There'll be little things. Uh, Instagram was taken down by a fav icon that wasn't as optimized as it should be. Um, Kellen Elliott McRae, who is CTO of um, Etsy, says that the thing you should be optimizing most for is change, because you just don't know what's going to be coming next. Kellen talks about how you're going to need to rebuild your systems every 10 times, uh, every time you scale 10 times. And that's true whether you're scaling 10 times in the technology or whether you're scaling 10 times in the size of your team. And the traditional way to optimize for change is to write clean code, object orientation, uh, service oriented architectures, unit testing, clean abstractions. And these make it easier to grow when you have a stable product. But these are all assume that the fundamental structure of your business isn't going to change underneath you. And that's not true for startups. At startups, the way to make sure that you're optimizing for change is more like this. You need to be building the track whilst you're on a train running down the track. You need to practice changing. You need to practice making sure that you can change all aspects of your system quickly and easily. Uh, and the easiest way to make sure that you can do that is to do it. So I think the minimum viable infrastructure might look like this. It might look like some kind of source control, some kind of configuration management for your servers, some servers. You want to make sure you have backups, because if you lose your databases, if you lose your data, then you want to make sure you can come back up again. And you want to know that your site is up. You want some kind of external availability monitoring. I think you could use something as simple as a GitHub repo, some rsync and bash scripts to make sure that your code gets deployed onto your servers. Amazon EC2. Uh, you could use S3 command to copy your database backups onto S3. And you could use Pingdom. And this is the bare minimum you need. And then you can improvise. And you can adapt. And you can run. And you can change. And you can keep doing that over and over and over again until you succeed. Am I serious about that being the minimum you need? Probably not. I wouldn't start with something that simple. But I know people that have, and it does work. It's important to watch out for four things. It's important to watch out for black swans. It's important to watch out for the incredibly unlikely events that will completely destroy your business. Magnolia was a link sharing site, like uh, Delicious or Pinboard. And they didn't have good enough backups. And one day, they had a small piece of database corruption. And they realized that they had just lost everyone's data. And they shut down. You want to make sure that doesn't happen to you. You want to make sure that you're you're prepared for the worst case scenario. Uh, 
You want to make sure that you're prepared for vendor lock-in. You want to make sure that you're thinking about which vendors you rely on and which vendors you would be able to change and do without. And, and you want to watch out for that, because vendors like to lock you in. You want to watch out for products like Merb that are about to become unsupported. And the newer a piece of technology is, the more likely it is that in three, three months' time, people are going to get bored and move on to the next shiny new thing. It's better to rely on old, trusted technologies than to look at the new things. And most importantly, you should look out for wasting your own time. It's very easy to get distracted. It's very easy to not focus on making sure that your site and your service is as good as possible. And you should practice improvising. You should practice changing things. You should practice making things better on the fly with a system that is maybe not as good as it could be. Thank you, and good luck. So we have a few minutes for questions. Um, I'd love to take any questions here, or if people want to talk to me about the specifics of a particular product they're working on, I'd be more than happy to take questions. Um, I'll be around for the next two days, and I'd love to talk to any of you. But yeah, does anyone have any questions? I was wondering about uh, optimizing for uh, for being able to change to, uh -huh. to 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 optimize your delivery cycle in introducing new features. Yeah. Um, we run into a problem that uh, our system is uh, not really maintainable in 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 delivering new features. Is it really worth it to switch over to another technology like from PHP to Rails and uh, and to a different database system? Uh, right now, or would you not recommend it and stick with the old product and just hire new people that will work on it? I, um, I don't think that Rails is any better than PHP for delivering new features. I haven't seen anyone be able to deliver new features faster because they're using Mongo instead of MySQL. Um, the, the way that you get better at delivering your features is organizational constructs. It's about the way you approach code. It's about the way you structure your workflows. It's about the things in the last presentation that I didn't entirely understand because I don't speak Polish. But it's, it's about the, the development workflows. It's, I, it's very easy to assume that if you switch to Rails, everything will be better. And the reality is that you'll get there and you'll still have many of the same problems. The grass looks greener on the other side of the fence, but it, but it isn't. I think uh, the, the easiest way to, to get good at shipping new features is to concentrate on doing the smallest thing you possibly can to make the smallest change at a time. Because it's much easier to move a link three pixels to the left than it is to completely redesign your whole site navigation. It is much easier to add one piece of functionality to a, to a profile page than it is to rebuild your entire user data store. And, and what you might find is that if you do that small step, you might realize that you're doing the wrong thing. You might realize that actually that one small change shows a new direction that you should have been heading in. Um, the team at Etsy have done a number of presentations about the importance of A-B testing everything. And they have two examples of projects where they didn't make small changes, where they did a large six-month project because they knew that that making these changes to search would make things better for their site. And at the end of six months, they realized that they didn't know. They'd been assuming that making these changes to search would make the site better, and it didn't. And they had wasted six months um, working on a big project. So the smaller changes you can make, the better. And that's possible whether you're using Rails or PHP or Django or any of the other systems out there. The database side is a little bit harder. Um, because if you, if you have a schema in your database and you need to change that, then, then that causes problems. Um, and thinking about how to manage that data through the different transitions is harder. But there are techniques you can use to, to, um, to make that possible in MySQL um, or Postgres. So, uh, and I'd much rather personally be using something like MySQL or Postgres that I know works than something like Mongo that, that I, don't necessarily trust at this point in time. And maybe that will change in the future. <laughs>
like the passwords, uh, the, the recent passwords in, in the startup community. Yeah. Uh, like you, you have built something two years ago, and and it's uh, all right, but it doesn't use Bootstrap. And for example, it's it, it's hard to to add yeah. new features, yeah. even if thinking about really minimal features. So it, it's costly. It, if I understand the question, you're saying, well, so how would you? Is it a good idea to switch your existing site over to using something like Bootstrap? And yes. how would you go about doing so? Yeah. So we actually did that at Typekit. So uh, we had a, a bunch of CSS style sheets that were hand-coded by the original team. And we switched over to using SAS. Um, and because we recognized the, the benefits that SAS would bring. Uh, and the way we did that was one page at a time. That you know We started with a new page that we were building. And we thought, well, we'll try SAS for this one project. If it doesn't work out, then great. We'll have to redo this one page, or this project might slip a few days, and that's OK. And then we launched that, and it seemed to go OK. So we did it on another project. And after a month or so, we were confident that we knew what we were doing with this new technology, and, and started then migrating old pages over to use the new system. And we did those as and when we had time. So the entire migration process actually probably took a year or so for us to get every last page off. But we got all of the important pages done really quickly. We got all of the pages that we were actually spending any time working on done really quickly. And the ones we didn't get done were things like the About page or the Terms of Service page or you know the pages around the edge that just don't matter. Um, I think it's important when you're doing those migrations to realize that if you don't get to a section of the site, if there's a system that you haven't quite turned off yet, but you haven't had time, you haven't felt the need to go and change it, then that's OK. Because if you're not working on it, then it doesn't matter if it's using the old or the new system, because it's there, and it's working, and it's running. Um, it's it's the, the easiest way to do these things is to do them slowly um, and incrementally, and not commit to doing them all up front. Because if you commit to doing them all up front, then then you have to stop everything else. And, and that means that you're not working on new features or new functionality. And it means that you can't work on new features or functionality until it's done. And that's very painful. So yeah, I hope that answers Thanks. your question. Uh, OK, I think we're done with questions now. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you.